Welcome to our studio where everything's already prepared for uh, today's interview. And our guest is Mr. Brian Wardrobe, the founder of uh, Central European investment company Arx Equity Partners. Arx has been around some 17 years, all these years, of course, with Brian as a uh, managing uh, partner. And uh, Brian moved uh, at the beginning from his homeland, Canada, to Prague and uh, stayed here with some uh, break in Budapest uh, till now. And I am sure that he's going to stay here much longer because he's got uh, big plans we are going to talk about in next probably half an hour. Brian, thank you for coming. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let's start with uh, the roots. How did it happen that uh, young Canadian gentleman shortly after his graduation moved to Prague and set up business here and stayed here for such a long time? Yeah, actually, it's, it's kind of an unconventional route into private equity that I took. So I, I actually, uh, really by chance, ended up getting a job or job offer to join a uh, regionally focused private equity firm called Bering Communications mm -hmm. Equity, and I was moved to Prague in that job. I knew nothing about Central Europe. So it wasn't Europe. your decision that you were moved here? Well, I, I, I was actually hired and joined the, the Prague office when it was being set up with that firm, actually. Um, and... Uh, <coughs> and it was an interesting time. So basically, the, uh, we were investing in telecom and media, and this was a, a, a firm that was sponsored by ING Bearings mm. or ING Bank. And uh, a couple of the notable transactions we did in, in Czech Republic were, uh, we were together with Intel Capital, we invested in Centrum.cz, which was ultimately exited to Warburg Pincus. Yeah. We invested or acquired Test Media, which was rebranded as Carnival a cable consolidation mm -hmm. deal and we, we, we sold that to UPC. So basically I was with that firm as an employee for a few years and then I had the chance to join what was uh, the predecessor brand name of ARX, mm -hmm. which is DBG and we were previously sponsored by Deutsche Bank. Like affiliation with Deutsche Bank. Yeah, we were affiliated with Deutsche Bank and then in 2007 we became completely independent. So we're now a completely independent firm. So talking about history of ARCS, is it better to start in 2007 like uh, it was time of your Central European expansion and uh, a lot of main investment were done afterwards? I, I actually think, you know, in terms of our history, we should really think about it from 1998 where uh, a couple of my partners, uh, Yaroslav Horak, Jacek Korpala, were actually investing the fund uh, earlier on, the early deals. Mm -hmm. So really our, our pedigree in the region dates right back to 1998, although I joined the firm in 2002. Okay, so far you ran three private equity funds yeah. and now you are, and I'm switching uh, just to the very uh, present, that you are just about to start fundraising roadshow uh, before establishing the fourth uh, private equity fund. Uh, we have recently uh, written about it, article for our subscribers, but now let's talk about, uh, about it for the rest of audience. Um, the clear thing is that you want to raise about 150 million euro and uh, as far as I know you are going to be more focused on um, Czech market uh, than um, before. So uh, tell me something about the strategy behind this new fund and, uh, and all these things. Yeah, okay, so, so in, you know, we have three funds under management currently, or, or we've raised and managed three funds. One of those funds is fully exited, which is fund one. So fund one was a 50 million euro fund, fund two, 70 million euros. Fund three, the fund we're investing now, 102 million euros. We expect yeah, that fund four, we haven't determined the exact fund size yet or the target, but we assume it should be in the 125 to 150 million euro range. Now in terms of strategy, it's interesting. We've, um, we've always been basically a buyout firm. So we, we, you know, we basically do control buyouts, lower mid-market buyouts. And what we've seen is that the, the environment in Czech Republic has become increasingly interesting to do what we do, basically mm -hmm. lower mid-market buyouts. And of, uh, of, the, of our 20 investments we've made over the years, nine of those have been in Czech Republic. We've invested the majority of the capital uh, we've deployed in Czech Republic. But even more recently, so of the last eight deals we've done, six have been in Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. So, so we're, we're, we are you know, excited about the opportunity in Czech Republic and we think there's some unique features of the country that, that are interesting for us. Can you tell me something about this uh, uniqueness? Uh, yeah. Because, you know, 
I guess all your investors are uh, foreign institutions and uh, when you talk about uh, Central European market everybody I brought, uh, almost everybody says uh, the Polish like the Polish market is most attractive, uh, etc. Larger, of course, than Czech Republic. And, 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 and from this point of view, it looks a little bit awkward that you are going to focus on the Czech market. So uh, what's, uh, what's the uniqueness of Czech market? Yeah, I mean, when we think, we think about our business like any other business person should think about their business. So we think about the addressable target market or the addressable size of the companies that we can target in Czech Republic. I think what you f we find is, is interesting. We target companies, I'll speak in euros, it's easier to compare across okay. countries. So we target companies that are generating revenues of roughly 10 to 50 million euros. So 10 to 50 million euros in sales. There are 4,000 companies roughly in Czech Republic mm -hmm. that meet that basic turnover criteria. Private owned. Uh, various forms of ownership. So we don't look, just, just the j theoretical pool of targets that generate that kind of revenue. Poland, there are 8,000. Mm -hmm. So though the population of Poland is four times Czech, the actual addressable target market for us at ARCS is only two times larger in Poland, whereas the competitive environment is much more intense in Poland. So we probably have eight or nine direct competitors in Poland. Maybe we have one or two direct competitors in Czech Republic. So in that sense, the sort of supply demand of capital dynamics really work in our favor here. Okay. Uh, what kind of companies are you interesting in the most? Uh, you have very uh, uh, great range of investment from chemical plant to financial services. And but what's your what's your uh, let's say core, and what do you want to uh, prefer? Yeah, what what we do? We're, we're not a sector specialist, as you say. Um, we're more of a situation specialist, so we're really looking for these succession opportunities. So companies like our uh, situations like changes Lanx, generation, generational changes, multiple owners, where we can maybe partner with one or two leading shareholders. Other owners want to be bought out, so give them a solution, an exit solution, and then take the company to the next level in terms of growth with you know the one or two leading shareholders or visionary shareholders. Mm -hmm. The um, so those are the situations we like in terms of sectors. One, one one sort of dimension that of our strategy that differentiates us a little bit versus the uh, other central european focused firms is we've done quite a bit of manufacturing and and we see that the the industrial tradition in czech republic the quality of sort of engineering driven manufacturing business is ex is extremely high in czech republic and the level of productivity and the productivity growth in Czech manufacturing is, is really unique in the region. You mean much higher than in Poland, for example? Actually, Poland and Czech are the winners. So basically, we've seen that um, labor costs over the last decade have risen, both in Czech and Poland, but productivity has grown faster than labor cost growth in both Czech and Poland. Yeah. But I think one of the features about Czech that's special is basically the, uh, the level of sophistication in manufacturing. So one of the, one of the statistics we look at sometimes is the the number of the penetration of industrial robots mm -hmm. per 10,000 mm -hmm. workers okay. and in that sense it's it's quite an interesting statistic it's unique and uh, how do you that, measure it or do you have any own, your own statistics yeah, no these are widely available are, okay, but i think public. a lot of investors don't dig quite so deep but if you look at that statistic um, the number of industrial robots for, per 10,000 workers in Czech is two and a half times Poland mm -hmm. and five times Romania. So you see that, that that leads one to conclude that the level of sophistication in manufacturing in Czech is quite a bit higher than the rest of the region. Talking about Lanex, which is quite interesting uh, story that you came there in 2008 and it was just before the, the big crisis hit the company and the revenues went down by almost 40 percent. But uh, eventually it was quite successful story as well and now you are about to sell it or are you in the process right now of selling it? Uh, can you tell me anything about it? Yeah, I mean, Lanex is a good example of a classic Czech industrial success story. So it's a company, if your viewers aren't familiar with it, which produces highly specialized ropes and fibers. And when and I some talk, packaging as well. Uh, but yeah, the packaging has been sold, so I'll come back to that. But the real core of the Lanex business is really the ropes and fibers, and especially the uh, the really sophisticated fall protection ropes for mm -hmm. climbing, mountaineering, as well as industrial safety. So our idea that we developed together with uh, our partner in the deal, Rudolf Gregorzica, was basically to acquire Lanex, buy out passive shareholders, um, at the same time acquire Singing Rock, 
which is a well-known Czech brand with global reach in the climbing equipment Fuc area, uh, Fuc climbers. harnesses, etc., and also for industrial safety. So basically, our strategy with the investment was, um, is, and was to position the business increasingly toward industrial safety. So um, industrial fall protection, ropes and harnesses. And within the Lanex group, there was, as, as you mentioned, a packaging business, a flexible packaging business. So the whole strategy in terms of the investment was first to divest or sell the, uh, the flexible packaging business, which is done. So we've succeeded in doing that. Now we're at a stage, it was a 2008 deal, as you point out, so basically it's a mature investment. So we've implemented our investment thesis, um, you know, it was a leverage deal, bank debt has been paid down, and it's now basically a, a business that's ready to exit. So we're seriously, let's say, contemplating various alternatives in terms of how to exit the business. So it's, it's, it's likely we'll probably see an exit on yeah, Lanx this yeah. year. How big would you like to uh, have a return of your investment there? <laughs> the, the bigger the better I think that's, um, <laughs> okay but your average in the Czech market is some 4.5 so could it be uh, on this level uh, frankly I think it's unlikely we'll get to that level I think it'll be a good deal and a solid investment for us but uh, I think it's less likely that it'll be in the kind of five times money range okay okay uh, I saw that the EBITDA the last numbers or last figures I saw were, 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 uh, were uh, published was EBITDA about 100 uh, million uh, crowns so the price uh, for sale could be around I don't know 700 I, I think the question really is how how strategic acquirers might look at that business. So they may look at, uh, there may be strategic acquirers specifically interested in the Lanx business, strategic acquirers specifically interested in Singing Rock. So I think the in terms of sort of the relative value... It, are, are, really, are, 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 excuse yeah. me, are, are you going to sell it together, uh, Lanx and Singing Rock, or, or even both uh, of them uh, separately? I think, I think we're, we're open to either scenario. Yeah, okay. could go either way. What was your the biggest success on the Czech market? Uh, what, what, what investment do you like most? I think the, the, the investment we like most is in our current portfolio. I mean, in our uh, recent of course. past, let's say. <laughs> okay, so from um, the past. Yeah, so, so no, I'll, I can talk about Vuez. So Vuez is a, is a fabulous company. It's, uh, it's a deal that was, uh, was led by my partner Yaroslav Horak mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, Thomas Lansky takes care of the investment for us, who is also very closely involved in execution and value building. So basically, the uh, Vuez is a manufacturer of highly specialized electric motors based in Brno. That's a great story. So basically, we, we were able to, to uh, acquire uh, the business from a large group of shareholders yeah. who essentially privatized the business, you know, partner with you know, a key shareholder, build a lot of value in that business, diversify the customer base, um, um, build the management team, broader management team, grow EBITDA in sales substantially, increase margins, and it's likely that Vuez should probably be uh, the best investment from a return perspective in our fund too. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, Vuez is definitely not for sale currently. We're still. It was, but there. it was, let's say, one year ago, two years ago, it was definitely for. Uh, it was there were some initial. Uh, yeah, we ex we explored. Uh, we, there was basically a process. We explored ideas, alternatives, and ultimately. And probably you are not sorry. You are not very much uh, sorry about the fact that you didn't succeed to find the buyer. Yeah, I mean, this was a deliberate decision. So we basically looked at the exit alternative at the time versus the value creation potential going forward and we decided that we would just hold the investment continue to create value maybe we'll think about it exiting it next year is it likely that you could stay maybe in the US uh, for some longer time than is usual in private equity I mean eight years uh, yeah. as a maximum can you imagine that you would stay there and uh, take uh, dividends uh, for let's say another five years in US? Uh, no, structurally we can't stay that long. So I'd say we, we, we can't. It's, no, it's, 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 you know, Your investors can, wouldn't allow you. To yeah, we that. really should wind up the funds. So basically we can hold things for say 10 years. Our latest exit in Poland, Argus, that, that was a deal we held for 10 years and it was a great investment for us. Um, but uh, no, so hol holding companies for 15 years is just not part of the private equity strategy institution. Okay, so you kind of imagine yourself uh, being a developer uh, or, or just uh, to, to become uh, an entrepreneur in, 
than some of your uh, most uh, favorable uh, businesses. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the the kind of the irony of the private equity business is it's usually you know the best companies that you would love to hold, which are also generating the best returns. So you tend to have to sell those businesses. Uh, so it's kind of a blessing and a curse. So you generate good returns, but you have to sort of you know say goodbye at some point to mm. your uh, to your baby, so to speak. Yeah. One of your famous uh, investments in the Czech Republic was definitely the Oftala or. Iclinic, yeah. uh, Iclinix, uh, Lexum, yeah. uh, that were definitely sold uh, in a recent month. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how was how was it with this investment? Yeah, I, th I think Lex Lexum is a is a very good example of basically our strategy at Arcs. So we we identified the Lexum business. We got to know the f the key founder, Professor Martin Philippetz, well, um, and we got to understand his vision. Basically, his vision was to create a, a central European market leader in eye surgery using the Lexum platform. And we, we got to know the business well and we got to understand that basically the, the Czech Republic has a competitive advantage in ophthalmology and uh, eye surgery. So the quality of care is simply higher in Czech Republic. And we looked at the Polish market and concluded that the Polish market it was uh, a few years behind Czech Republic. So waiting lists for cataract surgeries are much longer. Uh, prices higher, quality of care lower. So we basically with Lexum what we did is we partnered with Professor Philippetz who had the vision, bought out other shareholders, passive shareholders, and um, very quickly did an add-on acquisition in Poland. And this is why our, our presence in Poland was really critical to the, the success there. So did an add-on acquisition in Poland. So from a three clinic chain in operating in one country, Czech Republic, we grew that business to uh, inorganically and organically to 10 clinics. And then ultimately, basically, our work was done as a shareholder. So we were approached by a strategic investor from the UK, Optegra, yeah. a market lead, sort of global market re leader in ophthalmology with clinics in UK, Germany, China, and now CE Lexum. So we did an in initial transaction with Optegra in, uh, toward the end of 2012. We just did another, uh, they did another share purchase mm -hmm. earlier this year from us. We still have an earn out, so we still have some proceeds coming on the deal. But uh, but it was a you know I think a, a nice story and a representative example of how we you know back Czech entrepreneurs in many cases to expand regionally. In terms of revenues, it wasn't so big company, but uh, the brand is quite uh, quite uh, famous. Uh, how big was this investment, and, and what was the return? Yeah, I mean, well, the return I can't disclose for two reasons. One is we still have some proceeds coming on an earnout from Uptegra, so it's not done. So we should should still have some proceeds coming. Also, we're uh, subject to quite strict confidentiality restrictions on the exit with Uptegra. So I'm not just generally or, or you know grossly say. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not comfortable. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd rather not. Uh, the 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 gentleman from Uptegra probably wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't be pleased with me if I said more than that. Okay, about your investors, uh, I, we said that the, all of them currently are foreign institutions. Now with your new fund, uh, you are about to, or you have to convince them to uh, follow your strategy to uh, focus on the Czech market, which is not new for them because, as you said, you, your dom Czech market is your domain as well. Uh, but, um, uh, for example, EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, uh, as far as I know, they are not willing to spend any single corona uh, anymore on the Czech market for uh, different reasons. We can talk about them later on. Um, uh, how to deal with those investors, or is it only only this investor who doesn't want to spend uh, money in Czech Republic? Yeah, I think I think what well let, let's talk first specifically about EBRD, and there's a positives and negatives associated with EBRD's uh, withdraw from Czech Republic. So basically, the you know the reason that EBRD no longer invests in Czech Republic is it it was essentially a political decision um, related to the conclusion that the Czech Republic is no longer a developing country and has basically graduated. So EBRD and the Czech government somehow concluded. I guess it's official uh, official explanation. Isn't it's it? official information it's, explanation. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I thought that it was much more sensitive in terms of uh, some insults from former president Václav Klaus toward, towards to EBRD, uh, is it, isn't it? Uh, I, I, I don't know anything yeah. about that. Now that's beyond my uh, <laughs> uh, sphere of influence, let's say. I have no idea. The, the, the bottom line is EBRD has been a consistent investor with us. Um, they can no longer invest at all in Czech Republic. So what does this mean? It basically means that um, 
on the one hand, we'll have to replace them as an investor in our next fundraising, naturally. But it also should lead to more what we term in the industry's capital scarcity in Czech Republic, which is a good thing for returns. So it's, it's, it will be extremely difficult for other regional private equity firms to justify investing a lot of capital in Czech Republic if they have EBRD as an investor. Mm -hmm. And most of the regional firms do have EBRD as an investor. So it's our belief that um, the groups that have a strong focus on Czech Republic, um, good track record, good, good sort of local presence in Czech Republic will be at a, a relative advantage because there will be simply less competition, less capital chasing deals in Czech. Mm. By the way, how uh, much of your own equity you put into the fund uh, normally or in your former funds or even in your two uh, current funds and, and the, for this new one? Yeah, I, all of our team members, um, with the exception of maybe a couple of analysts, are investors in in the funds. So that's that's so not only partners. Not only I guess partners. you are three partners: two co-managing partner partners and one. I, one actually, partner. four partners. So we also have a, a Budapest-based partner. Oh yeah, that's right. So, um, but not just partners. So ev every investment professional. Um, at a, at a reasonably mid to senior level in the firm, invests in the fund, personal capital. So if you want to participate in the carry in, carried interest pool, you have to invest in the fund. That's fundamental to our philosophy. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the, the senior people in the firm, you could basically say, say that um, materially, you know, all or a substantial majority of our, uh, our respective net worths are invested in ARCS funds. And uh, what percentage of your own money in the whole fund? Yeah, let's say a t typically, and it depends fund by fund, but typically sort of the team commitment in, in, in the fund might be around 2% of the fund, sometimes mm -hmm. a little bit higher. So let's talk about your current portfolio a little bit now. Uh, definitely one of the most interesting investments you've made, you've, you've done is Bohemia chemical plant in Bohumin. Uh, that, um, you somehow found a side effect of its business that you are working on uh, invention of uh, let's say a very unique uh, unique and special um, special technique how to recycle uh, rocket fuel which could be quite interesting story for a potential investors so I presume that you are about to uh, use this story for selling Bohemia and uh, what, on what stage is this process of selling Bohemia anyway? Yeah, so, so uh, Bohemia is a deal we, you know, where Benson Oak acquired the business or a majority stake in the yeah. business a couple of years prior to us making our investment. So we made our investment in uh, 2010, Benson Oak a couple of years prior. So I think, you know, I don't obviously want to speak on behalf of Benson Oak, so just purely from an ARCS perspective, it's becoming a... But I guess you are harmonized in Totally this. harmonized, yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's essentially becoming a, a, a fairly mature investment again. So we were, um, in term, you know, when we made our investment, we had a kind of an exit strategy or exit thesis in mind, a couple of scenarios that could play out. And one scenario was, was basically selling the business in its discrete parts to generate the most value. And that's the path we're going down. So we did the transaction with Unilever last year. So that was, uh, that was a great deal. Um, and uh, I think Unilever is quite happy with what they've acquired too, as far as I understand. Now we have uh, basically two businesses in, in the group. So we have the traditional B2B chemical business, and then we have the rocket fuel recycling business, which we've now branded as Eruka Technologies. And um, it's, it's, it's a likely that uh, the B2B chemical business will be sold prior to realizing the Aruka business. Mm -hmm. So there's no process running, the business is not for sale, although uh, you know, we are seriously thinking together with Benson Oak about uh, when and how to monetize the B2B business, the B2B sort of traditional chemical business. Okay. Aruka, on the other hand, the rocket fuel recycling project, that's uh, it's another great example of Czech innovation, inventiveness. So the, the R&D team there at Bohemi basically inve invented a totally proprietary technology to recycle expired rocket fuel. We have a plant that's built, up, running, um, selling uh, the, uh, the, the recycled rocket fuel to European customers. We've recently hired a very senior uh, uh, sales director who's US based, who's helping us penetrate you know, the key market, which is the US. So I suspect that, that the strategy with Aruka will be you know, to hold that longer together with Benson Oak and really try and develop that almost as a, as a separate venture, really. 
could it be a kind of jackpot in your investment portfolio or do you have uh, great expectations of it? You know, I, I, think, I think it could be potentially, uh, you know, a great return. I mean, it's proprietary technology, it's strategically relevant. Um, uh, so on the one hand, it could definitely be a source of substantial upside. On the other hand, it's, it's very much kind of almost a venture capital or venture uh, type project. So the, the, the path to realizing that value you know, takes many years. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, difficult to say which direction it, it'll go in terms of timing. Okay. I found your name, I found your name uh, in a business or company registry in the Czech Republic uh, in a company called PZU Czech, uh, which reminds me, of course, uh, the insurance giant uh, Polish giant PZU. Uh, did you establish this company in uh, some prospect of uh, future cooperation with PZU, or what's the purpose of this company? Yeah, I, I, the answer is no. So that's just purely coincidental. So whenever we, yeah, whenever we make an acquisition, like most of the LBO firms, we we establish a local acquisition vehicle. Some SPV. Yeah, some SPV, or we acquire an existing sort of shelf company or SPV from the, you know, these, these, these uh, firms that basically have a, a shelf companies, empty shelf companies. So that's, uh, that was the acquisition vehicle for our Manag investment. So it's pure coincidence that it's PZU and I assume we'll rebrand it at some stage. Okay, so you won't use it as a, some uh, vehicle for cooperation with PZU? Uh, no, that's no, not no, at all part no. of our plan. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, you are in a four countries, you have offices in four countries. Um, f for example, is it perspective to keep an office in Romania? Uh, yeah, interesting question. I mean, we, we have, in terms of the organization and how we were, were structured, we have two primary offices. So our primary offices are Prague and Warsaw. And our primary focus as a firm is, is what we refer to as Northern CEE, yeah. which is basically Czech, Slovak, Poland. Um, and we have two satellite offices. So we have a satellite office in Budapest, a satellite office in Bucharest. These are you know, very small offices with the sole purpose to really originate transactions. And then execution in any of those regions would be run out of Prague. Now, in terms of Romania, um, it's, it's a country that's difficult. Uh, it's obviously gone through a significant downturn. Uh, private equity returns in Romania in the recent vintage deals have not been great. Yeah. We made one investment in Romania historically in 2003, which uh, we did generate a return on. Not a fabulous return, but a return. Yeah. And, um, but, our, but our belief, we will keep some kind of presence in Romania because our belief is that the competitive dynamic in private equity is getting increasingly interesting. So basically, um, there are very few players that are targeting Romania. Uh, the macroeconomic numbers are improving out of Romania. So I think it's unlikely that we'll make an investment in Romania this year. But over the next four or five years, I think there should be interesting buying opportunities in Romania. So we'll keep it? I think so. Yeah. Uh, you are still in Slovenia, for example, and yeah. Slovenia uh, looks, is looking to be a very attractive uh, market uh, now for also for Czech investors. Yeah. A lot of Czech investment yeah. were done there uh, recently. So, um, uh, and those investments uh, you keep are from uh, last decade. Uh, is it also about to be uh, sold very soon? Uh, okay, so we've we've made uh, two platform investments in Slovenia and one add-on acquisition. So the first investment we made there, Donut Testnet, was uh, exited in 2008. Good, very good return for us, and we still hold Tomplast. So basically, I'll with its add-on, with its yeah. add-on Unitplast. So first, I'll comment a little bit on Slovenia, and my perception of why the Czech investors also kind of like Slovenia, although the country is in a difficult state in terms of the the. Uh, macroeconomic condition, level of indebtedness, etc. There's a very strong industrial history in the country. So in that sense, there are certain similarities with Czech Republic. So there are a number of really high quality engineering driven manufacturing businesses in Slovenia. So on a per capita basis, there are a lot of those types of companies, which is interesting because they're not exposed to the domestic economy. So the export oriented businesses, and, and these are the companies we, we've invested in there. So in terms of our, our investment, Tomplast, Tomplast is primarily an automotive parts producer, so it's an injection molder of automotive parts, so that's the main business. 
And uh, we, we re did a dividend recap on, of that business in 2012, so we've taken our cost out, plus some uh, upside mm -hmm. in the form of a re-leveraging transaction. And that's really given us a runway to hold the, hold the investment longer. So we, we decided, you know, instead of selling it in a difficult market, as automotive parts producers were not selling at you know, great EBITDA multiples, we decided to hold the business, recap it, take out a substantial dividend, and continue to hold and develop the business. So I think realistically on Tom Plast, we'll think about exiting it next year. Okay. We are talking mainly about your successes, but what was uh, definitely there were some uh, some disasters yeah. in your investments. What, what was the biggest? Let's say I don't know about the biggest. Hungaro Camion, for example. You know, Hungaro Camion was an excellent investment. Really? Yeah, we generated a very good return on Hungaro Camion. So I, oh, it's many years ago. I think we did two and a half times money on on Hungaro Camion, which was in a relatively short holding period. So it was a good investment. The um, I think in terms of, we've definitely made mistakes. And, and the, the key in terms of how we've developed our strategy over the years, again, in 20 investments, we've become increasingly focused on a very specific type of sort of deal or transaction. And there's certain things we just won't do anymore. So I think a good example was um, uh, Axon in Hungary. Mm. So we invested in a, uh, 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 a leasing business, a financial leasing business in Hungary in 2007, worst possible timing. Um, and, and this company was basically, we thought it was, had an interesting specialization. So it was specialized on the SME sector and, and mainly leasing uh, equipment, uh, uh, machines, uh, some trucks, but basically almost no automotive. So we thought this focus was interesting, SME focus, margins were pretty good. And then basically um, two things happened. One, the Hungarian economy collapsed. Mm -hmm. So the underlying clients of Axon obviously were unable to pay. And then the, the ability to go and kind of repossess that machine, sell it for any reasonable value was basically impossible. Secondly, we were right in the middle of the uh, uh, foreign exchange denominated lending issues in Hungary. So the overwhelming majority of Axon leases were written in either uh, Swiss francs or euros. So the devaluation of okay. the uh, foreign hit us also. So ultimately the business did not go bankrupt, uh, still exists, and uh, we sold our, uh, our shareholding back to the founder of the business at, uh, and we, we essentially lost, uh, wrote off, uh, materially speaking, all our capital. Okay. So the, the, the lessons learned are what's important. Um, no more uh, financial services, you know, balance sheet driven financial uh, services I'm deals. I'm just going to talk as about a, FinCentrum. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, as, a, as a pure play investment. So I'll come back to FinCentrum. So we'll, we'll never you know, you know, buy a leasing business again. Secondly, uh, we're much more acutely aware of basically FX risk. So this, mm. you know, in, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, the foreign exchange denominated lending in Hungary obviously uh, looked like it was a kind of a silly thing to do with the benefit of hindsight, which is always 2020. But, uh, but, it, but at the time, somehow, you know, we thought it was logical. A number of lenders thought it was logical and we're much more careful on FX risk now. Just shortly about FinCentrum, yeah. uh, which was a very significant investment, uh, one of the, your yeah. biggest. Yeah. Uh, you are there with uh, Dynamic Capital, with uh, Lubor Jalman as well. Yeah. And, um, and especially the presence of Mr. Jalman there uh, could uh, uh, hint that FinCentrum could be in the future uh, transforming itself to the bank or I, I was uh, two years ago or maybe it was last year talking with uh, Mr. Martin Erli and Petrus Tuchlig and we were talking about the possibility of getting banking license. Uh, is it still likely? Uh, is, it your, uh, is it your strategy to, to move it uh, toward to, let's say, banking future of the institution? Yeah, so, so on, on FinCentrum, first we're, we're extremely pleased with that investment. So the partnership with uh, Peter, Martin, Lubor Jalman is, is working really well and the business is performing. So we're at a stage now with, with FinCentrum where basically at board meetings we're having, let's say, re really high level strategic discussions. So because the business is performing so well, we're able to think about what are, what are the strategic alternatives that could create value over the longer term. What, one of the potential scenarios could be in some form to develop uh, you know, some kind of lending business within FinCentrum. But, 
it's it's very very difficult to say whether that would be you know independently or uh, or in, in, in partnership with some other financial mm -hmm. institution. So the, the simple reality of FinCentrum today is those skills do not exist internally um, you know, in, in, in the business today, credit skills, et cetera. Um, although we're also looking at you know, at least uh, two other potential directions with the business in terms of growing the business. And uh, the reality is we, we, we in the management team won't be able to execute on all of these alternatives. So I'd say most likely let's say by the end of this year, a, a firm decision will be made, you know, which direction we should go in terms of the next phase of growth for the business. Talking about FinCentrum, um, I see one possible risk that could be uh, in the regulatory uh, sphere like European Union could push and uh, probably should push uh, those companies to be more transparent and uh, uh, to show the customers uh, the right provisions on their, they are based on them. So uh, can you see that as well? Is it, uh, what was the, was the, uh, what's the risk on this business? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think y your comment or your question is interesting. I mean, we do see that the regular, regulatory environment within which FinCentrum operates um, has evolved, is evolving all the time, and, and we expect it, it will continue to do so. So what, and a couple of points here. First, there's been uh, an increased level of um, regulation in terms of uh, uh, you know, national bank kind of documentation, et cetera, that's required for the business. So the regulatory burden in terms of administration is, is increasing all the time. In that sense, um, we, FinCentrum is actually at an advantage because FinCentrum has economies of scale and the very small IFA businesses are having an increasingly difficult time carrying the cost of all that administra administration and bureaucracy. So that's point number one. Point number two on, on sort of the level of commissions and, and transparency, probably the UK is the most, uh, the farthest ahead in, 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 this, in this area in Europe. I mean, when we made our investment, we thought about this and we basically concluded two things. One is FinCentrum is a very high quality business and we looked at the corporate culture of that business, the philosophy, how it's run, how it was founded. And Martin and Peter really um, have instilled a culture of transparency in that business from day one. So in this sense, we believe that we hold um, you know, an asset that's basically already uh, selling high quality products, transparent, doing good service for the end client. Um, also, you know, in our discussions with Luber Jalman before we invested, we believe that fundamentally there's huge value in distribution of financial services. Mm -hmm. So in whatever form, regardless of the level of regulation transparency, you know, banks and insurance companies, basically issuers, will still um, strongly favor the use of IFA networks because it's simply a very efficient way for, for those uh, issuers to distribute uh, th their financial products. Okay, Brian, thank you very much. Uh, just let me ask you uh, in the end of our interview, uh, do you, are, are you planning to stay in the Czech Republic uh, for the rest of your life or are you going to move uh, somewhere for other opportunities? Uh, I'm, I'm very happy and settled in Czech Republic. It's a, Prague's a beautiful city. I, uh, I'm married to a Slovak, you know, we're happily married with our first baby. And, uh, you know, we, we really love living in Prague and it's just a, it's just a very special place. So, so I, I'm, I'm lucky to be based here and I'll be based here for many, many years. <laughs> okay, so good luck and thank you again yeah. for, for being here and I think it was very interesting. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. Thank you for watching us and I uh, hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to another opportunity to uh, see you.